mankind and the elements. For some, it's an uncomfortable bond. It's not really a good idea to have divers in the water with a thunderstorm. For others, when weather strikes, inspiration begins. If they have a catastrophe, we can be there to help them. These are the people who challenge nature, seek out its limits, reveal its secrets, and embrace its awesome power. In this episode, we'll meet an elite team of diver scientists using an underwater laboratory as a home base for scientific research. Our scientists can spend days and weeks underwater. A man growing millions of trees to be planted across the devastated forests of the American West. I'll always work with plants. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. And in Boulder, Colorado, an extraordinarily gifted rock balancer. My approach was to experiment. What happens if I add one more rock? These pioneers of the great outdoors ahead on That's Amazing. If you find yourself in the creeks of Boulder, Colorado, you may come across this man. Yoda is like one of the grand masters, and one of his major things was try not only do, there is no try. Michael Grab is a rock balancing extraordinaire and a prominent member of a growing global community. That's kind of a philosophical approach to all of this, is you just do it and you don't think about it. He's determined to master this natural art form, and his approach and discipline boggles the mind. If you think too much about it, then it collapses and you break fingers. My name is Michael Grab, and I'm a stone balance artist. I just balance rocks every day. <laughs> I just started doing it randomly one day in Boulder Creek uh, about eight years ago, and it just kind of turned into a therapeutic kind of activity, practice, ritual, so I just kept doing it. Boulder is a really beautiful place to wake up in the morning. There's just a special feeling about being here, especially when I'm going to the creek every day because it's just kind of this constant renewal of energy coming through the city. It's kind of an ideal place for rock balancing. The whole learning process with balancing rocks is very organic in my experience. Like I just started making tall towers, biggest rock to smallest rock. And you do that enough every day for years and eventually you start noticing nuances and you start taking it a bit further and a bit further. It's just kind of like a universal human activity. And that's something I find to be really fascinating about all of it. Like I thought I was the only person doing it for a long time. Then I came to learn that all these people in like pretty much every continent except Antarctica balance rocks. <laughs> One of my big inspirations was a guy I saw online named Bill Dan. He's kind of the pioneer of the whole counterbalance style. A counterbalance is just where one rock holds another rock in place. So if that rock is removed, then the other rock falls. I usually start by looking for a nice top rock, like a big rock I'm gonna display on top. I kind of look for the rarest rock possible, something with an interesting feature, like color or shape. Sometimes I'll just go where the interesting rocks are, then I might spend an hour or two just figuring out where in that spot I wanna build. That kind of drives a lot of the creative process. Most people, when they watch me, they just see me completely frozen. But what I'm doing is every split second, I'm juggling anywhere from three to nine different contact points or vertices of balance, just like trying to isolate certain connections. It's like a three-dimensional gravity Rubik's cube. That's the way I visualize it. The zero point is a term I began calling the moment when I know that it's balanced and I can let go. It's kind of this infinite feeling where there's no separation between me and these objects. There's a few elements that go into like the quintessential stone balancer. There's rock selection, location selection, and photographic skill. A lot of balancers are strong in one aspect and weak in another, but my goal is to be exceptional in all three. 
I'm kind of a perfectionist. Even though the art form itself says, no, you can't be a perfectionist. <laughs> One of the special things about rock balancing is you surprise yourself often. If you're willing to just experiment, what happens if I add one more rock? And that's kind of the universal dilemma for any rock balancer. Either it collapses or it stays balanced. There's been so many times where I just wanted to quit. Like there was a storm coming in, it was windy, it started raining, or it's snowing and my fingers are freezing. But I just keep going because I know it's possible. I visualize it, I felt it, but it just takes those micro adjustments. And 95% of the time, it usually works out if I stick with it long enough. And sticking with it long enough can be a few days. It's like a yoga almost. It's like a pure deep meditation. And maybe that sounds a little bit hokey pokey, but it's a real feeling. <laughs>
kind of first got into it probably 10, 12 years old. I was begging, begging, begging to get a telescope, but and, you know, we were in a very rich family, so it took a while to get it. And one Christmas I got a telescope. Then I started using it and I got aperture fever. Uh, you want bigger telescopes all the time. So I started learning how to build them. I learned how to, how to work in a machine shop. I, and I can build things that I wanted to build. And a lot of that was astronomy parts. I kind of modified my life to fit this study, this kind of lifelong study. Sandlot is a very tiny little observatory. It's only 10 foot by 10 foot wide. The telescope I built uh, over a period of about a year and a half, and it may not look very polished, it works really well. I'm good with that. I don't have a degree in astronomy. I have a passion for astronomy, and I've done it for many, many years, and I've, I've contributed, I think, to the scientific body of astronomy. That's, that's really kind of a, yeah, from that standpoint, I am an astronomer. Aquí no hay espacio para error. Y un error, cualquier mínimo error, te puede costar la vida. No es un juego. Free diving, spear fishing, es, es, no es para todo el mundo. La pesca submarina es un estilo de vida. Hay mucha polémica con, con, con la pesca submarina. Y no, no sé por qué tiene tanta polémica. Es, es y seguirá siendo la, la pesca más selectiva del mundo. Eh, la pesca que, que menos daño hace. Mucha gente que lo, lo que piensa es nosotros entramos con un arpón al agua y es a matar y a matar y a matar. No, no, las cosas no son así. Muchas de las ocasiones entramos a observar, a dedicarnos, a, a disfrutarnos lo que es el ambiente marino, a disfrutarnos las especies. Estás trata, intentando aprender un, cada vez, cada día, un poco más del, del planeta azul. Hay que, hay que ser bien considerado por las especies. Ni cogerlo muy pequeño, ni demasiado grande. Toma lo que necesitas. Lo que sabes que puedes lidiar con su venta o su consumo. buy from local guys it comes back to you and you know you're getting a local fish it's sustainable you know that's an honest thing Thank you. some 
sometimes we forget that we are part of the ecosystem. We are animals too. And we are very ignorant. Very ignorant too. Ser inteligente no es joder el mundo como lo hemos hecho. Ser inteligente es conservarlo. Conservarlo y de alguna manera hacer lo mejor posible. I've always been inspired or, or fascinated by weather. What does a cloud sound like? You know, even as a child, I can remember sitting out on the grass and looking up at the clouds as they go past. What kind of sound would those clouds output uh, using a piano if they, if they roll across the keys? My name is David Bowen. Uh, I'm a studio artist and educator. I make kinetic and robotic sculpture, and often uh, these robotic devices respond to some sort of natural input. Cloud Piano is a robotic installation that plays the piano based on the movement and density of the clouds as they move across the sky. As you can see, it's a device that mounts to the keyboard of a piano, and there's another component, a camera, that's mounted outside the building here. And as clouds go past the camera, the, the video is sent in real time to a computer that then scales the data. What I've done is taken the video feed from the camera and chopped it into 88 individual pieces as if they are the 88 keys on the, the keyboard. So as the clouds go past a particular key, that key is pressed. And so it's basically a simple algorithm, I suppose, that says if you see more white than blue in this little section of the video, then press that key. I guess you could think of it then as maybe a collaboration where I set up this certain situation and I'm making these choices, but after that it's kind of up to the weather. These odd sounds that the piano is making continue to build or dissipate or move and change shape. Machines or computers are thought to be very orderly and very precise, and likewise, uh, nature is thought to be very chaotic. What keeps me interested is I think there's a lot of systematic ways to look at these things that we associate with chaos. Every year, the world's most elite mountain bikers gather in France for a race unlike any other. It's the longest uh, downhill race in the world. The Gavalanche is 18 miles long to be exact. And it's an adrenaline-filled ride through all four seasons, starting in an unlikely spot for a bike race, 11,000 feet up on the snow-capped summit of Pic Blanc, in the French Alps. This is Remy Absalon. He won the Gavalanche. I started mountain bike when I was uh, young. Enduro and mountain bike is really cool because we can explore uh, all around the world. Mecca Avalanche uh, Alpe d'Huez take place in the French Alps in uh, Alpe d'Huez, so not so far of Italy and Switzerland. It's uh, really high in uh, Alps, so you have a um, very good uh, view, 360 degrees around you. It's really crazy, I don't know why uh, I do that. You ride all kind of terrain, first the glacier and after the rocky section, the forest. is really physical with some uphills. So when you cross the line and you are first, you're, you're really happy and uh, you want to, to try again. About a third of the United States is covered in forests. In places like Colorado, 
those forests are in danger. There's fire. Our wildfires are getting more frequent and larger. A devastating beetle infestation. Those trees are all dead. They don't have any branches anymore. They're just standing sticks. And global warming. There is hope, and it's found in an unlikely place. When I tell people that I work at a forest in Nebraska, they, they usually laugh, and they're like, Nebraska has a forest? Richard Gilbert is a man on a quest. He's a biological scientist who works here at the Charles Bessie Nursery in Halsey, Nebraska. It's the oldest federal tree nursery in the U.S. The nursery's main mission is to help preserve and repopulate national forests in the Rocky Mountain region. Without Bessie, they're not going to be able to have the supply of trees that they need for reforestation. If they have a catastrophe, we can be there to help them. You know, I think most of the perception for Nebraska is that it's large and it's flat, very boring, not pretty at all. Lots of corn and soybeans. But there's lots of beauty here, there really is. Nebraska had been treeless, 1800s, it, it was, has been treeless for quite some time. Charles E. Bessie was a botany professor at the University of Nebraska. Absolutely loved Nebraska, loved the sand hills. He loved trees. His mission was to get a forest planted somewhere uh, in Nebraska. They got seedlings out of the Black Hills, they got seedlings out of Minnesota. And they brought them here and planted them onto the forest. 20,000 acres were hand planted here. It was chosen for the plentiful water, the sand, and the ease of producing the seedlings and extracting them out of the soil, getting them bundled up and planted back out onto the forest very quickly. What I love most about my job is really the change in season and the change in work that I do. I get to work in the seed bank, I get to work in the container part of this, and I get to work in the field. And I get to actually get my hands dirty. I don't just sit in an office and, and push paper. Richard's amazing. He really cares, and he's always trying to make it better. We turn the greenhouses on, you got little seedlings germinating. It, to me, it's spring. So my spring starts really early. Uh, and it's extremely rewarding. He's very proud of his work. He's very proud of his trees. I love growing plants and helping them grow. I don't ever want to lose that, that contact with the plants. The San Juan National Forest, I think, is about 1.6 million acres. One of our biggest challenges that's happening is we have a large epidemic of spruce beetle happening on the San Juan National Forest. We believe that, that the beetle epidemics were controlled by cold winters. Climate change is happening and we know up here that we have not had cold winters. Cold winters is what controls beetle epidemics. But the beetles use the sap from the tree to help fill up and protect their eggs. It's sawdust and egg and sap all mixed together. Where we're seeing the spruce beetle attacking the trees, when those trees are all dead, they don't have any branches anymore, they're just standing sticks, they're starting to fall over. The spruce beetle epidemic that we're seeing is unprecedented. We collect seed from the trees early before we, the beetles hit to maintain a seed bank. Bessie Nursery is a very important part of our organization. They are the ones who store all of our seed and they grow all the seedlings for us. When they need them, we grow them and we get them produced in less than a year. 
All of the trees are produced in the greenhouses and then they are brought in here on tables. This Y is okay because it's above halfway and we have a central leader. We can pack 110 to 120,000 trees per belt per day. We are packing container trees for the San Juan National Forest. They don't get their moisture in the spring a lot of times, they get their summer monsoon seasons. That's when they want their seedlings delivered. Richard remembers all of this information. He wants the feedback and wants to know how they did. At our best, we might get 70%, 80% survival. Without Bessie, they're not gonna be able to have the supply of trees that they need for reforestation. Rich Gilbert is very proactive and he's adapting and doing as much as he can to, to prepare the nursery into the future. Starting from a seed to a finished product, and it's a wonderful experience to be able to be part of that. These trees are gonna outlast me and they're gonna outlast Rich. It's not often you can have that kind of legacy on a landscape. Plants are just amazing, and there are so many of them out there, and I will never know how to grow every single one. If it's a very, very interesting plant, I'll try to produce it and grow it at the house, and if you guys drive by my house over there, you'll understand. You'll see all the different plants that I have over there. Across the planet, coral reefs are dying at an alarming rate. Scientists estimate that 30% of the ocean's reefs have disappeared due to human activity and rising ocean temperatures. Coral is kind of like the trees of a forest. They're just the backbone of a whole tropical ecosystem. And if they disappear, we're in a lot of trouble. Ken Niedemeyer is coral's last best hope. He developed the Coral Tree Nursery, a simple framework of PVC pipe tethered to the ocean floor. In this nursery, he is able to grow brand new fragments of elkhorn and staghorn coral and replant them on struggling reefs in the Florida Keys. He's planting 25,000 new corals a year, and his methods are inspiring conservationists across the tropics. Been growing up diving, spent a lot of time in the water. One, two, three. And I basically watched the coral reefs dying. As the reefs died, the fish didn't come back, and I realized I'm tired of watching it die, I need to do something about it. And so I developed this whole idea of growing corals in an offshore nursery and replanting them on the reef. So you're kind of like a farmer? I'm a farmer. <laughs> yeah, we grow corals just like a farm. There's a good time of the year to plant, and there's a harvest time, and we have five offshore nurseries in the Keys. Each tree can hold 100 corals. We start with little fragments that we collect, and after six to nine months, maybe a year, that fragment has turned into a colony that might have 100 centimeters of growth on it. We cut that off, and then we plant it out on the reef. So we just harvested some corals, and we're gonna take them out to Pickles Reef right now and plant them. We've got a couple thousand of them out there that we've already planted, and we're gonna add some more. It is a, a bit of gardening. When you put the corals back out on the reef, you're saying, ah, I think that would look nice over there, and that one would look nice over there. And some of it's based on what used to be there and what should be there, and that's how we do our planting. We planted 20,000 already this year. We'll plant 25,000 next year. Those corals will probably spawn next year. Part of the long-range goal is to get the corals reproducing on their own. I'm excited every time I get in the water, whether I'm going to work in the nursery or whether I'm planting corals or just looking for new areas to plant. A lot of people said, oh, you can never do that. I can't do it on a big enough scale. And I think I've proven that it can be done. And if we can train enough people and teach enough people in other places, I think we can really see a significant turnaround. Another day, another coral. The world's oceans are under siege. Marine life is dying at alarming rates due to accelerating pollution, overfishing, and climate change. People keep saying we're at a tipping point. Some people say we're beyond a tipping point. But six miles off the shores of Key Largo and 60 feet deep sits Aquarius, 
the world's only underwater research laboratory. There is no other place where people live underwater and work on the water for extended periods of time. The diver scientists who work here are called aquanauts, and they come from all over the world to spend weeks at Florida International University's underwater lab, conducting cutting-edge research on oceanic health. This elite group faces danger in the elements for the sake of the planet in a race against time. The first time I saw an ocean, I was amazed by the vast expanse. It really made me feel insignificant. As I started to spend more and more time around the ocean, I started to see that we do affect what's happening underwater. Well, we're seeing ocean acidification. We're seeing coral reef decline, and we see a lot of degradation. I don't think people realize is the impact that oceans have on people in the middle of the country. Everything associated with the ocean controls climate, controls local weatherized patterns. The world's reefs have been valued at $375 billion annually. That's for fisheries, tourism, protection, uh, of the coastline from storms. The research at Aquarius is being conducted at a critical time. Aquarius, Aquarius Reef Base. Got camera and all that, right? That's a Roger, we got the main lock on. Aquarius is the last undersea research laboratory dedicated to science and education in the world today. There is no other underwater habitat doing what we do, how we do it. It allows researchers to live at their study site. They can do incredibly long working dives, dives which couldn't be done from the surface. When you're diving from the surface, the deeper you go, the less time you have. When you live underwater, the habitat actually becomes your surface. When you dive from the habitat, which is about 50 feet, and you dive to 90 feet, you're not really diving to 90 feet. You're really diving to 40 feet from the surface. So now what you've done is you've extended that time period that you can actually span that 90 feet. That's where it really separates from the traditional research or work that's done from vessels uh, on the surface of the water. That makes a big difference. Marine ecologists use it as a base of operation. Others want to use it for extreme environment mission operations. We do a number of projects with NASA, and they say that Aquarius is very similar to what astronauts experience in space. In the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we had 60 or 70 research labs underwater, and now we're down to one. In 2011, there was a shift within Congress, so the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration started to pull back in funding. Every one of the science community said, you know what, we've got to do what we can to save this. FIU leapt at the opportunity. It makes it official. The FIU age of Aquarius has begun. We had gone from getting ready to shut it down. And here we are almost four years later, and we're still going. You can control a lot of things, but you can't control the weather. We make a choice to take on the inherent risks that are associated with being exposed to the elements. The constant real-time changes that occur with weather, the possibility of getting stranded out at sea, the surface crew is forced to postpone operations. And right now, it's not really a good idea to have divers in the water, especially with a thunderstorm that has uh, lightning strikes. But the aquanauts below continue their work uninterrupted. Everybody who works in an offshore environment fully understands that that mission may be postponed a week, a month, may be canceled at any time.
Everybody when they're five years old wants to be an astronaut or a marine biologist. I never grew out of it. Living and doing science underwater is the coolest thing I could possibly imagine. What does it take to become an aquanaut? We look at people who have considerable experience underwater. Diving has to be second nature, and it's not uncommon for people not to finish aquanaut training. They start to understand that maybe psychologically, I'm not prepared to be in a confined environment with five other people for 10 days. That's the typical length of missions, but we have done longer ones. We've done 16 day, we've done 18 day, and the longest one to date have been 31 days long. We've saturated 392 scientists now. Both you guys got your masks, fins, PC, depth gauge, pressure gauge, computer. Check. I can honestly tell you from the bottom of my heart that I enjoy waking up in the morning and then coming to work. Yeah, I enjoy my job <laughs> a lot. It's not an easy job, keeping Aquarius going, constantly fighting weather, constantly fighting corrosion. But every day we wake up and say, all right, we've got to do something today because what's happening with the oceans isn't stopping. This team of Hawaiian sailors is on what might sound like an impossible mission. To sail around the world using only the sun and the stars as their guide. Their boat is a replica of a historic Polynesian voyaging canoe. She's called the Hokulea. There's no motor, no nails, no metal to hold her together, just ropes. The goal for Captain Bruce Blakenfeld and his crew? To honor their ancestors who used this form of navigation and prove it is possible to sail the open seas without any modern technology. Voyaging canoes, the mode of transportation for navigating the vast area of uh, Polynesia. You know, it's like over three million square miles. And that was the way our ancestors traveled. This is our culture, and we're celebrating that. So we're on Hokulea. She is a replica of a Polynesian voyaging canoe. The Hokulea was built with the express purpose of proving that navigation by the ancient way was very viable. That these canoes could be guided over 2,000 miles and long distances. There's about five miles of rope on this canoe, so that's definitely traditional. There's no metal, there's no screws, there's no nails, there's no braces that hold the canoe together. There's no navigation equipment that we use to go across the ocean. When we are navigating the open ocean, our biggest clue that tells us where we are and where we're going is the sun. The sun, as we know, rises in the east and sets in the west. So if we just know where one point of it, then we know where everything else is. The stars do us the same thing. It's like the compass in the sky. We memorize close to 200 stars and know where they rise and where they set and how they move across the skies. The sun and the stars and everything work in conjunction with the swells. So in the absence of the sun, then you maintain the, the orientation of the canoe to those swell patterns. That's a very difficult thing. We started in Hawaii in end of May 2014. We embarked on this worldwide voyage, which first ended up going towards Tahiti through our ancestral routes, and now we're here in Martha's Vineyard. We see this overwhelming support from peoples all around the world. Hokula is a symbol of, of hope and of pride. A big part of this voyage, right, Malama Honua, is to train a whole cadre of young navigators and captains. Well, wait, uh, we'll leave the back sail. Let's get uh, the 23 out, a big four sail. Kaleo Wong is one of the apprentice navigators. 
He understands that you know it's going to take long hours and lack of sleep. He understands how to use all the tools that nature provides. Kaleo and these others, they're just like a, a pinch of salt as far as the people who know how to do this type of navigation. When I'm on Hokula, you know, and we're sailing in the open ocean, I feel like definitely a, a deep sense of pride of what our ancestors were able to do and what we can still do today. When we're in the middle of the ocean, we're seeing the same swells that they would have saw, the same stars that they would have been looking at and using, the same birds, the same everything in the ocean. But when we're on the canoe, definitely connected more to our culture, to our people, to our ancestors.